close that door. Oh, okay. Got it. If somebody else comes, that's great. So I, I was telling uh, telling everybody <clears throat> if you got here late, my trainer for some reason scheduled his flight out at two o'clock, so he's already left. So I'm gonna just go through kind of the basics of an AC system, and some of you might be kind of old hat and and uh, something that you already know. But if you got any questions or you've got any particular thing that you've seen and want to ask about, just jump in. And, and what I started with, this was a, uh, this was a, uh, not a slide presentation, just some drawings that I put together and for, uh, for one of our OEMs, for their salespeople. <clears throat> And just the heart of the system, the AC, the compressor, is the heart of the system. And there's basically three compressors that's used in the commercial bus market. And I'm sorry, I'm the. I wish I had slides. I should have should have turned these into slides. But there's three basic compressors: there's a TM16, a TM21, and then a much bigger compressor <coughs> that's used um, mainly in medium duty, like the F550. In that application. Um, usually a TM16 is your is most prevalent and a TM21 that gets you in a system that's rated around 70,000 a TM21 will take you to the next step which is around 80,000. So you can BT, use uh, BTUs yeah. right so you can use the same components and get a little bit more BTUs out of using a bigger compressor a little bit bigger return or suction line and that moves just a little bit more refrigerant cools the bus depending on how you're on a hot day in Colorado uh, probably 75,000 is good in a different climate in Texas you know 80,000 so those are those are just some of the compressors that are in the industry the, the, biggest one. the TM 31 is the biggest one down here at the bottom and it actually has down here at the bottom it actually has a small sump that the oil sits in the other two don't and that just keeps it lubricated and keeps enough oil right there to completely lubricate that compressor the TM16 and TM21 rely on the PAG oil that circulates through the AC system to keep it lubricated and there's a specific charge of refreon or of refrigerant and a specific charge of oil that goes into all the systems and that keeps everything in balance how many horsepower does that draw the TM31 we actually, um, when I was with, uh, when I, I used to be with Eldorado, I worked for Eldorado for about 19 years. And we would put the bigger compressors on the Navistar chassis, and we actually had to have a small cutout switch so that when the drivers were accelerating onto the highway, mm -hmm. it would cut the TM31 out because it draws so much horsepower. Mm -hmm. Now the TM21 and 16, you don't notice it. I mean, you obviously you're going to notice a draw on the system, but it's nothing like a TN31. So that's why they're more for medium duties and that type of application. Do you guys, do buses ever use an electric compressor? Um, you're actually starting to see electric compressors make a, an appearance in the electric bus market. So it's not prevalent yet, but it looks like it's going to be. The school bus market's already changed over, and they've got that in pretty much full development. There's companies like Motive, Lightning Drive, which is right here in Colorado, um, Green Power. There's a lot of these that are starting to build uh, electric buses on like the E-Series cutaway chassis, and they will use an electric compressor. Lightning Drive? Lightning Drive is, is here in Colorado. Okay. So, any questions on compressors? I mean, it's pretty basic, and most of the time, you know, you want to know what time it is, not how the watch works, but that's just kind of a, a, the base of the compressors used in the industry. The condenser. You can have two different types of condensers on your bus. You, 
you can have a skirt or a roof condenser. And that the condenser's job is to change um, the high pressure, the, the gas, into a high pressure liquid. And as it goes through the coils in the condenser and the fan goes across it, it starts to pull the heat out and condenses the vapor into a high pressure liquid. And the high pressure liquid then goes on to your, uh, com your expansion valve. This process needs to be done smoothly and it needs to be done um, without what they call um, non-condensables. Non-condensables are contaminants that will get in the AC system. Um, that can happen when the tech puts his gauges on there and doesn't purge the system, um, has left the top off the PAG or the refrigerant oil, and it will absorb some moisture. And just over time, all of those will attack the compressor, and you'll see when the compressor starts to fade or starts to die, you'll see the oil start to turn black from its copper color. So there's, there's a, just kind of a natural flow or order to the system. And as this refrigerant goes through, and the fans blow across, and these fans are actually, you can't see them on the back of the, of the condenser, the skirt condenser, but they're sitting up there at an angle and you've got your skirt, your face of your condensers here pointing out the skirt. So when you get out of the bus and you leave the AC on, you can hear the roar of those fans. Right. If you ever get out and you hear something, you know, as you, as you operate a bus, you kind of learn to know it's, it's, you know, what it sounds like and if there's something, if it handles different or sounds different, that's something to, to kind of keep, keep in mind. If one of these fans starts to go, it let, it, there's not as much air being pushed and this vapor isn't condensed into a liquid. And there's a sight glass on there too, on the dryer, on the condenser, and I'll go, I'll show you what that is here. But it'll start to show bubbles, and those aren't actually air bubbles, those are gas bubbles, because things aren't condensing, the refrigerator, the refrigerant is low, or it's got non-condensables in it. So your, evap your condenser is kind of your first stage of the AC system starting to change the refrigerant. So it's important that the technicians evacuate it and do a really good job. And there's so many different steps. A, uh, refrigeration has gotten so much more sophisticated than it used to be back when you had a, you know, a Chevy Nova that you just stick the gauges on and could if you had air conditioning in it and, and would read the gauges and say, yeah, that's okay. It's just become more sophisticated in the techs. Um, we did some training in Pueblo and, and they are all seem to be very um, tuned in to doing a better job of getting the, getting the refrigerant clean when it goes in, getting the pressures right. Our trainer is, um, he's very old school. They use the machines. He likes the manifold type gauge. There's just a lot of intricacies to charging a system that keeps the buses on the road. And the condenser, keeping it clean, making sure that the fans are functioning, and making sure that the condensing process is happening in a smooth fashion. So that, those coils are, they live inside these condensers? They do, okay. they do. They're actually, they're actually packed right in here. And those fans blow right through them and blow, blow the heat out. So that's how it's removing the, the heat, taking the heat out of that and condensing that, um, it's much like a, um, if you if you, um, you ever cooked with a pressure cooker, it's the same type of application. It's condensing and putting pressure on that refrigerant and condensing it. And that's what's going to help start to cool the system. That's the very start of it. So if it's not working properly, a lot of times they say you need to clean it out. And they're, are they talking about cleaning this part out? They're talking about cleaning the coils out, making sure they're getting clean. And one enemy of a skirt condenser is the sodium chloride and the, the salt brine that they use on the roads, that unfortunately doesn't work well with aluminum. And that's usually what most of these are. We actually use a copper and an aluminum in the pro air systems. Um, but just keeping them clean, especially just keeping them washed out, making sure the fans are in good shape, uh, your system's gonna live longer. So you can just take a pressure washer, spray them mm, off, it's not, no. You'd wanna, 
you want to be careful the pressure washer. Okay. It can do some damage with the fins. So how would you how would you try to get it rinsed off? Well, you basically just have to get in there with a garden hose. Okay. If the front's open, you'll be able to see the coils, and you'll be able to see if there's dirt packed in them. And if nothing else, when the technician puts it up on a lift, you know that's a good time to check it. But just keeping it good and clean, and making sure that the air is cool coming out when it starts to when it starts to be um, when you're running down the road and you got the air blowing across it, you're not sitting um, let trapping the air because when you sit there at an idle, your AC system uh, doesn't work as efficiently because it's not moving air across the coils as efficiently as when you're running down the road. So that's kind of an idea of, of how important it is to keep that condenser good and clean. Um, and then again, like I said, listen to the pitch of the fans. If something sounds different when you get out of the, get out of the bus and you, you don't hear that normal roar of those fans, something might be wrong, something might be different. Any questions on condensers? When does the cooling actually take place? So when the condenser, when it come, when the uh, cooler comes into the condenser, it's in a liquid state? No, it's in a gas. The way to remember it, the way I remember it is that compressor cannot pump liquid. I'm not confused by this drawing then. Well, it See comes backwards. It comes in as a gas up at the top and the from the condenser no from the compressor I mean excuse me from the compressor right the compressor turns it into a gas the compress it actually turns into a gas on its way back through its okay. journey and I'll show you that okay it I'm, comes I'm ahead the, of it then. yeah you're a little bit ahead but that's fine that's a good question so, I guess what I want to know is 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 what is there a temperature variation between the uncolored and the red yes there is that's when this, the, that's when the key thing happens because the change of state Right, exactly. Okay. And it's uh, it's high pressure. When it leaves that, that compressor, it's high pressure and it's it's superheated. And as it comes through, as it comes, well, actually it's not superheated, it's heated up. Mm -hmm. But then as it comes through the condenser and this gas refrigerant goes through there and it's put under pressure and that air's pulled across those coils, that's when it starts to condense into an actual liquid. Because it's cooling. Because it's cool. Well, no, it's not cooling yet. It's pulling heat out of the refrigerant. And being under pressure and that compressor pushing it, it starts to change the, the boiling point. It starts to change the, the makeup of the refrigerant into a liquid. And then the liquid, and I'll, we'll, go, we'll go to the next step here. Let me get to the, and it doesn't go to the evaporator. It actually goes to the expansion valve. And it goes to the expansion valve. There we go. And there's several different types of expansion valve, but the job of the expansion valve is you've got you've got high pressure heated liquid coming up to that expansion valve. What the job of that expansion valve is? Let me scroll down here a little bit. I'll show you the what this looks like. So you got the refrigerant coming in and this expansion valve has this orifice tube that actually is in the fins or within the body of the uh, evaporator and it's sensing temperature. It's kind of like an accelerator of the system. As this senses temperature it allows this orifice tube to open and close slightly and then that allows the amount of refrigerant into into the the thermal expansion valve and it changes at that point from a high pressure liquid to a low pressure liquid that's the job of the expansion valve to make that change because you can't have high pressure liquid running into the evaporator it has to be changed and that's the that's the expansion valve so sometimes if things in the system aren't working quite right these will have thermal cutouts or just cutouts and that will kick the compressor out if something's out of whack within that thermal expansion valve. If you've got a block in the system from the condenser and it's not pushing the amount of, of oil and, and refrigerant, that, th that, that valve will have a cutout, an electric cutout to that condenser, excuse me, to the compressor so you don't ruin your compressor. So there's several different things that can make a system 
not cool. That's what I'm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So this is actually located right up by the evaporator, just right up there on it. In fact, I'll go to the next picture here. Is this the same in a car or a car's entirely different? Car's gonna be a little bit different than car's gonna be a little bit different. And I kind of I kind of skip one and while I'm here, this is I'm back on the condenser, but this is oh for Pete's sake. Um, So let me go back to the condenser. Before it goes, I don't know why all my, go back to the condenser. Actually, let me go back to the receiver dryer. The receiver dryer is actually located on the condenser. And it has, it's actually right, right there. On the condenser and it is actually before the thermal control valve or the expansion valve and this is what I was talking about it has a sight glass on it and if you can see like I said like a cloudiness or milkiness like you can see it actually in that sight glass that means the system's not charged or you've got some type of restriction you got something that's not quite right it may be cooling and maybe just needs a little bit more refrigerant but that's an indicator that there's something wrong now that's, it's kind of like a, kind of like a, an idiot light in a car. Hey, the car's starting to heat up. That's kind of the way you treat that receiver dryer because there can be so many things the technician needs to ferret out and figure out exactly what's going on. But that's a receiver dryer and I kind of blew past that. How can the refrigerator <clears throat> just disappear? How could it be low in the refrigerator? How, where'd it go? Leak, a slow leak. Um, that's a whole different section on finding they make dyes now, they make yeah. uh, nitrogen, that's probably the best way to test for it. It would have to be a, a leak or a break somewhere, just, just, it doesn't just uh, by osmosis go through the system and in the air somewhere. And I'll show you, we actually, the, sometimes in, during the installation, we use a two-clamp um, two system called the quick clip system, or the easy clip, depending on your hose type, that we use, a, um, we use air equip hose. And so we use this system that's got two clips and an O-ring and it's got a nylon liner. And all that goes together to form a seal. If one of the technicians doesn't get that just right and crimped correctly, you can have a slow leak there and have it slowly go away. Or the non-condensables that I was referring to, and that can be um, you know, particles or moisture in the air, or excuse me, in the refrigerant. It could be any of those that that will cause the system to have um, a, that milky appearance. But it's usually usually just a, a refrigerant, low on refrigerant. Sometimes that'll fix it, sometimes not, if you add more to it. So, can I get you a chair? You can come around sure. and sit down. We were just going over the parts of the AC system. We're working our way from the compressor to the condenser, to what the receiver dryer does. Are you a driver? Are you a tech? Uh, manager. Manager? Okay. Okay. We're just kind of going over the basics. My uh, trainer left me. Okay. So we're just going to do some basic stuff okay. here. If you got any questions, holler. Okay. I'll try to answer. Okay. So that's what the receiver dryer does. And that's a perishable item. If you open up a system, you want to take that out and replace it. That's that's kind of your safety valve of the system. It lets you, um, it, it filters out all the impurities and that's where it's trapped. So every time, well, every time you open the system, it's a good idea to replace it so that you don't have any of those um, non-condensables in there. Now we'll look at the evaporator. Okay, let's go back to the condenser. Let's 
So your evaporator, the thermal expansion valve, turns that refrigerant from a high pressure liquid into a low pressure liquid. And that's what starts to work its way through the evaporator. And that's where the cooling comes in. And this is what I have trouble wrapping my head around. You're not actually cooling the air, you're pulling heat out of the air. And that is all part of this process. And I can't, if Reed was here, he could explain that to you better than I can. I, I can't even really get the technical words in my head to explain it exactly. But it's all part of the condensing process where this is now starting to condense. The air is blowing across it and it's starting to, to uh, pull the heat out of the air and the, con the conditioned air is being put into the cabin. And this is the transformation um, as it comes in. It's that high, it's that low pressure liquid. And then as it condenses and the heat's pulled out of it, it changes back into a gas. That's the process that you were asking about. Because your compressor cannot compress liquid. It has to compress a gas. And that's when it starts to change back. And you want that to be a smooth, even process as well. And this is actually just the entire system, the way it looks. Uh, receiver dryers by the condenser, it's actually usually on it. But the whole journey starts, the expansion valve, and then there it starts into a low pressure liquid, is worked through and turns into a gas again and repeats itself. Any, any questions? Could you explain, if you can, that statement of like heat causes the refrigerant to boil and change from liquid to gas? Is that the heat from the air? That, that is actually the chemical change in the refrigerant. Yeah. The refrigerant... But when that, that, when that change happens, there's a heat exchange to, to right. either taking on or giving off one or the other. It must be taking you're, on heat out of the air. You're pulling, you're pulling the heat out of the air. Yeah. And that's what, when that starts to condense, that's what forms, uh, that's what forms all the moisture yeah. on your coils because it's pulling the heat out of the air. And that heat, that energy's gotta go somewhere and it comes off in the form of that condensation. And it, it, is, it is hard to kind of wrap your mind around exactly how that process works. Because you've got this refrigerant trapped in these coils and you're compressing it and turning it into a high pressure hot liquid that will, you know, you can't hold your fingers on that side, on the high pressure side. But then the low pressure side, you come off, you got water vapor and it's cold. So it's just, it's a, it's just that, that process. That's happening in the condenser. What's that? That's happening in the condenser. That's happening in the evaporator. That's in the evaporator. Right. So your condenser is where it condenses from that gap, from a gas to a liquid. To a liquid. It changes from a um, high, high pressure liquid to a low pressure liquid, goes through the evaporator, the heat exchange process happens as the air moves across and the, the water vapor it condenses and starts to remove heat from the air and that the effect is conditioned air that, that is in the passenger cabin and then on its way back to the compressor becomes a gas because the heat has been expended or pulled out of it. Now, in the evaporator they're saying when you charge a system with coolant it's storing a lot of that coolant in the evaporator? Well, it actually stores it, and I'm not a tech, but it actually stores it throughout the system. And it should be, it should be pretty well balanced throughout the system from what I've, from what I've gathered and from what, just the conversations I've had. It's not necessarily stored just in the condenser or in the evaporator. The system will equalize. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. What is a limiter switch? No. A limiter switch? Yeah. Well, is for like on a thermostat or on a... I had trouble with air conditioning on my, on my truck and it turned out it just wouldn't cool, it was freezing up. That'd probably be your expansion valve. Same thing. That's a limiting, get right. Yeah. And that, that's, that's the point where that, that conversion from high pressure to low pressure mm -hmm. liquid, and it probably might have had a limiting switch on it 
that for whatever reason was kicking the compressor out or depending on how it was designed. But I'm guessing that's what you're referring to as a limiting yeah, I switch. I don't know. Um, a lot of times the, a lot of times they will have um, just a little switch that sticks out and then has wires running to it um, and then they're wired into the compressor control. But it, it really kind of depends on how this, what system you have and actually make of the vehicle. But that's what a limiting switch would do is it protects your system. It's a good thing. You just don't want to have, to have it work or go and have to work, put it that way. Are there any quick, there's also expansion valves. Let me, let me just, one quick explanation. There's an orifice tube. An orifice tube just makes that conversion. It doesn't have any, it doesn't have any adjustment to it. It just makes that adjustment from high pressure liquid to low pressure liquid. So there's orifice tubes, there's um, block valves, which is basically the same thing. In fact, I think I had, uh, oh, they weren't on this slide. It was on my other slide. Well, are there any other questions over the, over the system itself? On the, on the evaporator, one thing you want to look at, and there's, there's basically on co the commercial cutaway market, there's what they call an in-wall system, which fits neatly into the bulkhead at the back, and then there's also a ceiling mount, which comes out from the back and is, um, has the louvers on the front. There's two different types of system that's being installed. One will have the vent, or the filter right up front that you can pull out and make sure it's clean. And that would be, if that's dirty, it can freeze up because there's not enough air moving across it to make that condensing process or the evaporation process work. And then the um, regular roof mount, what we've used in the industry for a long time, the filter is in the back um, underneath a louvered cover that you'd have to pull down and take that and wash it out good and just make sure it's good and clean. And that'll help your system as well. Um, I've got, um, I can show you just some overall piping diagrams that, that kind of explain how a system's, and it, especially on a bus, let me see here. Um, here's, let me show you that easy clip system that you were talking about, um, about the leaks, you were asking me about the yeah. leaks. So this is this is what that looks like. Just make a quick connect, huh? Yeah. And there's a special pair of pliers that you use. Well, I use that on fuel systems sometimes now too. And I'm sure it's yeah. kind of the same application. But you use a special oil. There's two clips, um, the clip retainer, and then there's two O-rings on that. Sometimes if you roll an O-ring, that can give you a slow leak. Um, that's a cutter, and then those are the special pliers, and I don't have any way to really, I don't think I can enlarge that without screwing something up, but those clips, those pliers are designed to grab those two ears of the clips, and then they're set to a certain torque. And if they go off to the side sometimes, or you don't get them quite square, you can, you can come up with a leak. So it's kind of important for the technicians to, to make a really good connection there. But that's that's what the, the quick click or the easy clip system, there's several different ones out there, depending on your hose. Let's see, where was I headed before I saw that? Some like tubing diagrams or something. Tubing diagrams, thank you. So this is um, probably one of the most common that's just an overview of a cutaway bus and just how the system lays out with the compressor that's, like I said, the TM21 compressor, the red indicating high pressure, 
and then coming into the evaporator and then that transformation back into a condensed uh, gas. What's well, going to the condenser first? <clears throat> the condenser's right here. What's going to go there first? Right here is going to be, you start out with a gas and it's under pressure and then it goes into the condenser and it starts to condense that gas and change the, the formation of that gas into that high pressure, that high pressure liquid. Is there a PSI measurement for as liquid and as the gas? I'm just curious. There is. How strong that is? It's just kind of like when the doctor takes your blood yeah. pressure. There's different measurements, and it's your those measurements are are the, the critical determining factor of the health of your system. Well, my question: When you say high pressure, I mean we're talking really high pressure, or we're um, hundred and I'm not a tech, but I mean like a hundred and probably twenty to hundred and. 30. That's what I was wondering. Yeah, yeah it's, it would be something like that. And on the low side, um, 30. And everything everything um, makes a difference on how the low side looks and how the high side looks. If you got um, one thing, if your, your high pressure needle is bouncing a little bit, that could mean your reed valve and your compressor starting to go south on you. So there's different things those gauges will tell you. Any questions on, on the diagrams or? Those run under the chassis or under the floor? Those are all ran under. How long do we have for this session? Uh, to 145. 145, okay. So actually the heater lines, um, especially on an E-series, and that's what Gary and I were talking about earlier, the heater lines, and there's usually two valves. Sometimes there's only one, but usually most manufacturers put two in. Sometimes they only put one. It just depends on the manufacturer. But the floor heater, um, they will run to the back, and they're all routed underneath. You don't want to route them above just in case of a burst. Um, but they come up through the floor, and the shutoff is usually back in this area somewhere. And then your AC lines are also all ran underneath the bus. All right, now you're saying <clears throat> something that actually happened, I think, if I'm making okay. that a connection. This past winter, we couldn't get the back heater to work. And it's a new, a new bus. And uh, somewhere, somebody figured it out. That there's a, a valve to turn underneath the driver's seat Right. It's actually not under the driver's seat. It's in that area, but it's the drops are right about back here. And nobody knew about it. Yeah. And we couldn't get the heater to work. And everybody's freezing. And so there was just some, somebody just gave a quick, oh, you turned this valve, and I didn't catch it. I was brand new at the time. And so I'm thinking with what you said, that's going to come around again mm -hmm. pretty soon, and I won't have any idea what to do. Um, you basically just get on the, on the under the bus under the bus under the bus under step um, actually okay so you open the door yeah. and the driver steps here yeah it's about right here and you got to crawl under the bus and the heater drops come out from forward about right here yeah. right behind the, the back of the cab yeah and then the shutoff valves are mounted on those and what do you do to them they either turn well, opposite from the way they are now or one or two or what usually um, a lot of a lot of manufacturers use a quarter turn valve, and they actually say off and on. Okay. So if they're in line, that's yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, I know if that. they're down, that's all you need to do. And so what, do you want to turn it off, or do you want to turn it on to get heat? You want to turn it on so that everything flows through the system. So right now it's switched off. Probably in the summer it's switched off. Because the air conditioning works fine. Right, right. And so for winter time, we'll crawl under there and turn it to? You want to turn it on. You want to in line with the rest, okay. with the lines. Right. I don't know how he how he figured this out or somebody knew, but I just went in passing. I had no clue. Yeah, uh, you know most of this stuff. It's good to start with the basics. Is there a flow of water back there? And and uh, the problem is if you don't know those valves are underneath there, you never think. Well, to I had no for idea. Them. The air conditioner was also the heater. Well, actually, they're two different systems. Oh, they are. They can be. They can be incorporated. You just have one switch though that you button goes from snowflake to sunshine to 
something else on to do foss um, and that's the add-on system yeah okay what well, it there's elect there's what they call um, electronic controllers usually the manufacturers will use the OEM chassis there's an auxiliary set for the add-on AC and then there's a set for the OEM dash most manufacturers will use that auxiliary set every now and then you'll get an agency or a spec that uses what the, what we have is, is called an EC1 controller, and that's and that's a push button. Yeah, it's a push button type thing. Actually, actually, I think I got a picture down here of it. on the cowling. On yeah, the right. yeah. Yeah, I think I think I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's only on B18, B12. Is it on B12? Nobody knew how to figure it out. I just kind of figured it out a trial and error. I think this is the one where we had the trouble with the heater. In the back, I'm sure I got that. With no manual or anything else, no, it was a mystery. There, it is. Now, the, let's see. This is just the brochure page. And those are different. I mean, those you still will shut off, but that's that's what it looks like right well, there. Well, it's that's, different from that, but that's it the is. concept. Thermal King has one, and uh, I think MCC has has a uh, Climate Air they call it, and it's it's different controllers. But you get the snowflake, and then you get the temperature variant, and then you get the fan speed variant. Yeah. Right. That's that's more of an optional or a spec driven um, item. You don't see it in just real basic specs unless an agency or a state wants to use this EC1 controller. So this would still have the valve I'm talking about? It'll right? still have the heater valve. And so then you would have to use this controller in connection with turning that valve? Or now no? this particular controller is only going to be for your air conditioning. It has three settings, snowflake, sunshine, and defroster setting on it. Well, it actually has a thermostatic control for your dash setting, your auxiliary controls, your compressor will be off or on. It doesn't have um, it depends a little bit on how the manufacturer will wire it, but most manufacturers will wire that so if that, where it, where it turns from, from blue to, to red on the dash. I don't have that. Okay. I just got a switch that says uh, AC and then AC high, which basically is just internal air, and that's all. Okay. And the back one is, is so totally separate from that. Right. Well, you're, this won't control any of your heat. This will control the temperature of your AC system. Okay. So you can, if it's too cold, you can, you know, you can, you can adjust it to where the passengers are uncomfortable. So this is just being ignored in the winter time, and you got to turn that valve and just right. use the regular. Well, and it, when I, when you say ignored, remember too, this is going to run the compressor and help you defrost as well, help you take humidity out of the bus. So you can possibly run both systems, and but the heat is going to be in a separate system. Okay. I understand now, thank you. And there are what, what Gary and I were talking about called heat strips that are in the evaporator, but I, I won't even go, there's, you don't see that very often as a primary heat source. That's usually a secondary or a supplemental heat source. Well, the defrost, the defrost usage on this is the problem around here because we don't have humidity. True. So the windows aren't gonna fog up no matter what. True. But in Kansas, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, 30% humidity out here, and it's like 80 at home. So yeah, yeah. I can see you, all the windows would be exactly. running. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, I understand. but yeah, and then there, there should be a separate toggle switch, high medium or high low or high medium low, depending on how it's the switch is used for your floor heaters. There'll be a separate separate control for floor heaters, and that's what that the, that valve underneath the seat. Yeah. That's what that is in conjunction with. Is there any questions? Does anybody have anything? Um, you know, there's some other stuff that. Are the guys here like certified in, in your guys' systems and products? Well, everybody has to have a certain certification, or they can get really racked by the EPA. And I I know there's probably at least one or two here at Davy that are certified to do AC work. 
Um, most shops will have somebody certified to do, it's a certain classification. Actually, there's sometimes there's two because you gotta be certified to actually buy the refrigerant as well. Right, So that's, that's something separate. But I mean like for your systems or whatever. Um, we go in and do audits and that type of thing for installations, but you know, everybody can install our systems as long as they're um, certified to do refrigerant work. It doesn't, our system isn't necessarily set apart by any certification. It's all systems and then the refrigerant, that's what they're, that's what they're touchy about, is being certified to handle that. Um, again, any, I, I, I know I've probably confused you guys a lot, but uh, if, uh, if there's any more questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks.